Welcome to the Dark Zone, an adventure racing podcast. <laughs> it's being able to have enough trust in your teammates to say, hey, I'm hurting. And Lori and Alex were right there. And they were like, let me grab your stuff. We're going to keep moving. And they grabbed my stuff for the next couple of hours. And, and, and then, you know, and I had a chance to get some protein bars and we get some food in me. And then four hours later, I was feeling fine. But it's having enough trust in your teammates and in yourself to say, you know what? I'm hurting. I need help. Okay. You people sit tight, hold the fort, and keep the home fires burning. And if we're not back by dawn, call the president. You're going the wrong way! What? You're going the wrong way! He says we're going the wrong way. Oh, he's drunk. How would he know where we're going? Yeah, how would he know? Thank you. Thanks a lot. Welcome to the Dark Zone Adventure Racing Podcast. This is your host, Brian Gatens. This is a throwback episode, April 2023. Team Nawal, not all who wander are lost. Four Americans headed down to the Malacara multi-day adventure race in Brazil. They had a fantastic time. Kind of strangers, kind of didn't know each other, jumped into it with both feet and had a great race. This is a great Great interview. All the members of the team are on the episode. They tell stories. They dive in. The mud, the fun, the food, everything, everything. So welcome to the Dark Zone. Hope you enjoy this episode. Nawal, thanks for being here. You guys are the best. Sit back and relax and enjoy the show. Thank you to Jade Eagles from Wealth Garden Financial Services for sponsoring this episode. Jade is a fellow adventure racer who first started in Australia 15 years ago and recently completed the World Championship in South Africa. His other passion is helping individuals and their families establish a positive relationship with money and partnering with his clients to plan for a financially secure future. To learn more about Jade and his financial planning practice, The Wealth Garden, please visit www.thewealthgardenfs.com and drop him a note. That's www.thewealthgardenfs.com. As a listener of The Dark Zone, you know that we support Ascend Athletics. We encourage everyone to head over to ascendathletics.org and check out their new initiative called Invest in Her, an investment in the future of girls in places where access is limited. Ascend Athletics does a great job working with young women in Afghanistan and Pakistan through education, climbing, and other opportunities. We encourage all of our listeners to visit ascendathletics.org and check out Invest in Her. Thank you for being a listener, and thank you for supporting Ascend. And remember, Ascend pays nothing for this sponsorship. We like what they do and are proud to pass along word of their good work. Welcome to the Dark Zone Adventure Racing Podcast. This is your host, Brian Gatens. Today we have Team Nawal. Not all who wander are lost. They were the uh, the sole American team in the Melacara race, which was down at Florianopolis, Brazil. Uh, They call it Floripa. We will call it that as we go here. They consist of Jamie Borglum, Lori Ike, John Harris and Alex Young, um, four racers. They traveled to a faraway land where no one spoke their language, and they came back chock full of stories. I guarantee it. We're going to drag those stories out of them, the whole experience. Jamie, before we get it down to Brazil, tell us about Team Nawal. Where did you start? Where have you raced? Fill the listeners in. So Team Nawal was uh, a team that I started uh, racing just a little bit this last year. Um uh, with and and kind of created my my daughter actually came up with the name and uh, as, after doing a few races in uh, Wisconsin and uh, southern Minnesota, um, I had gotten to know John through his race uh, that I had done um, through another friend of mine and uh, the posting came up on Facebook for uh, you know the Malcara race and. I half jokingly messaged him and said, man, this would be a cool race. Don't you think? And, and John pretty much said, heck yes, let's do it. (laughs) And, uh, we started talking about, you know, who we knew that, that, uh, would be interested in it. And, uh, John knew Alex and Lori, 
um, from uh, his side of things. And uh, we kind of just all agreed that, yeah, let's do it. And we started uh, planning and making, uh, you know, making plans for it. And there, when we showed up, I mean, it was kind of a, uh, looking back on it, it's kind of one of those things where it's like, holy cow, we did that. So did the, had the four of you race together before this race? Uh, so we, um, we did do a couple of practice races, um, before the race. So, um, Lori and Alex and I did, uh, one race and then the four of us raced, um, in, uh, we drove down to Alabama in December and that was our first race together. Right. Am I thinking about that? Right. I, I want to actually add in here that we had all committed to doing this race in Brazil before we had actually met. And then yes. we decided to do a couple of practice races. And I'm glad that we actually got along when we met each other at those so, practice races. Yeah, so, like we had we hadn't raced together at all. Um I was I had raced in John's races and I knew Alex used to race. And uh, but when John asked when John <laughs> emailed me and he was like, Hey, you want to do this thing? I was like, it gave me took me about 10 minutes to just be like, Yeah, of course. I was like, Are you sure I can do this? He's like, Yeah. I'm like, all right, I'm in. But isn't that so? So, okay. So, for the newer listener, welcome to Adventure Racing in a Nutshell. For people who know each other a little bit, right? A little bit, not a ton. You, you, John's races, and we want to hear about John's races in a second. I want to have John talk a bit about the races that he puts on. But the four of you, sight unseen, agreed to fly to a foreign country and do a 500 kilometer race, which went through a whole eight sections, all these different stages. You know, adventure racers are a rare breed, right? And we're now less than four minutes into the podcast, and we've said something that will have most non-adventure racers kind of scratching their head. I know people that won't go to the corner store unless they've known the person for years. The four of you got on a flight together and went to Brazil and decided to do a race together. Yeah. Yeah. So so this is John. So Lori's not telling the whole story in that um, Lori was the very first person to sign up for my very first adventure race that I hosted as a race director. And what race and, was that? What was that that's race? The, that's the Pocket Gopher Challenge out of Minnesota. Okay. But Lori grilled me for like three emails on what was my race, what was it all about? And she came down and she did an absolutely amazing job in my race. She actually came back to my winter challenge. She's like, all right. And she, they, she actually won my winter challenge in her division. But what she brought race? she brought Alex down to my winter race. And Alex forgot something for her bike. I don't remember what she forgot now. It was but an accident. They, yeah, they ended up borrowing my bike. And the two of them just they did they had, they had a great time. They did a great job in my race. So I was like, if there's any other two racers that I would race with, it would be those two, hands down. So when Jamie and I got to talking about it, I was like, I've got to call Lori. So I, I texted Lori and Lori's like, I'm in. And then she talked Alex into it within a matter of minutes, I think. And then all of a sudden, off you go. And then and then the only four of you only raced together. What was that race in Alabama that you did uh, together? We actually did math too, guys. We did 18 oh, Alabama. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we did. So so how did so from, so from a teamwork perspective and the fact that the four of you are, are on this podcast right now and you're looking nice towards each other, yeah. how did you – I didn't know. It could all be smoke and mirrors, right? You could all be, you could all just be very polite to each other. We've all been there with former teammates. Um, did you have conversations prior to going to the race about teamwork and dynamics? We, we just had Ben racing on it. Ben racing just one expedition Ozark. And Chelsea Magnus talked a lot about how they had a ton of Zoom calls before the race where they talked about scenarios and people and situations and teams. Did you do all of that or did you just sort of, let's see what happens when we get down there? Yeah, we met weekly um, on a Zoom call, and um, a lot of that was just coordinating equipment, coordinating logistics, but it's also like talking about what kind of team we're going to be. Our number one goal was to finish the race still friends, to gotcha. be able to go home and still be friends with each other. <laughs> gotcha, that was, right. Um, mission achieved. We did that. Uh, so that was that was great. Um, and I think the Zoom calls were, were so helpful because I'm, I mean, we're all coming with different levels of experience and um, the the just the the fun facts that i learned as a fairly new racer from you know someone as experienced as john has been doing this for years 
Um, but just what I can learn, you know, ahead of the race, as much as I could learn, I, I was trying to absorb as much as possible there. So it was combination race preparation slash learning experience for you as you were getting ready for this race. And those and those weekly calls, to your point, were about logistics, right? Who's bringing what gear, what safety equipment. But on top of that, it created a low entry for the team to begin to gel as a team. And you began to get a sense of feel for each other. Yeah. And one thing that we also did, so like, Jamie coordinated everything with the race directors okay. so that we didn't bombard the race directors with questions from three different people. Right. So J- Jamie was our point of contact with Brazil. Alex comes to our team with a wealth of experience in biking. So we relied on her for all of her biking experience. Uh, Lori does a lot in with, with, with paddling and a lot in the water. And so, you know, we, we kind of, I guess my point is, we, we knew we were a team that we, we just wanted to finish. And like they said, we wanted to finish as friends. But we relied on our expertise that we had, even outside of adventure racing, just in general. And we decided from the very beginning that as a team, we were going to make decisions together. Uh, and we just felt we were better off as a team rather than having like one, like, for example, um, you know, some teams have one primary navigator and that's their responsibility. We did not have that. So we all navigated and we all took turns navigating depending on whether we were tired or where we felt our strength was. But we made a decision early on that we were going to rely on the four of us. And if we have a navigating question, we would ask. And that's just how we raced it. And it, it sounds to me in this very early in the conversation that it, because you had the conversations beforehand, because you knew each other, you had, you had raced together, you had raced around each other in each other's orbit. It sounds like the four of you were relatively aligned regarding the expectations for the race. Like it was mentioned that you want to finish as friends. It wasn't as if there was one person on the on the team that was insisting on a top 10 finish, right? We're going to clear the course and somebody else was getting dragged behind. It sounds like going into the race, you you knew where you were. You knew where you wanted to end up. You knew where you'd have to concede some things. And you knew where you'd have to push yourself. And I, I think for the newer racer out there, and I think that's agnostic to the length of the race, the fact that you have that conversation prior to the race, you have a sense of the way the race is going to go, right? Because if you're different pages, things just disintegrate, things just fall apart. So yeah. it sounds like that worked really well for you in advance of the race. Yeah, what what we what we had gotten from the race directors was the uh, the fast time finishing mm-hmm. for each leg. Uh, so I took that and just extrapolated it out to like if we were to take the entire time of the race, the entire time the course is open to finish this, what's the slow time for everything? Right. Um, and then we use that as kind of a gauge for like how like how to pack our stuff, how much food to put into things, um, kind of just understanding like we're not going to be the fast team. So like let's um, let's understand if we're taking if we are if we're pushing ourselves, but we're not like overdoing it. What does that mean from a from a timing and planning logistics. Gotcha. And, and to your point, and, uh, you know, race race directors in these big races put out schematics and a schematic is a breakdown of the race that the racer gets in advance of the race that shows all the different stages, right? And I know that you know this, I'm saying it for the audience. It shows the stages where it shows like where a paddling stage goes to a, a cycling stage, goes to a trekking stage, goes to a ropes or rappel, caving, whatever it might be. And then on top of that, you have to pack for those different transition areas where you see your gear. You know, it, and I'm sure we've all tried to explain adventure racing to to people who don't adventure racing. Like, wait, you carry your stuff for 500 kilometers? No, you don't. It's staged for you along the way, and you're able to pick things up as you go. Jamie, coming with your experience and having a primary point of contact with the race director, and John was spot on. There are some race directors that will only talk to team captains, like James Thurlow, who ran I Terror for years, would never take an email from a non-team captain. So, Jamie, from your perspective, how challenging was it to work with a Brazilian race director who probably probably spoke Portuguese where you had to break down that information for your teammates? Was there a cultural language barrier going into the experience? Uh, a little bit. So the one of the two race directors spoke some English, um, uh, you know, minimally, but some uh, we communicated uh, entirely through WhatsApp and through messaging. So it, you had the Google translate um, basically for it. Got it. Um, So for the most part, you know, the, the translations were pretty good. There was a few times where the translations were, you know, were definitely off that we had to kind of put our heads together and be like, okay, what's, you know, what, what do they actually mean here? But uh, for the most part, the communication was pretty good. Um, 
you know, on the, for the buildup. And they were always willing to ask questions or answer questions when we asked, um, you know, one, one thing, and that's kind of a joke uh, for us as a team, but uh, we were asking questions and we were a little, you know, we were, it was like two days before the race or something. And, and these guys know I'm, I'm the planner and I tend to be the one that also gets a little bit of anxiety and worked up over stuff. And, uh, I'm, I'm messaging the race director director and I get a response back that says something along the line, uh, you know, here's what you need to do, blah, blah, blah. And then at the end it says, come calm. And I think it was a translation, but it says come calm. So now our joke is kind of, okay, come calm. Come calm, right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Relax, big guy. Take it easy on the way and come calm. <laughs> and so the. Now getting to the, to the race itself is, you know, the expression is, you know, the hardest part is getting to the start line, right. And, and coordinating all of that. How did that go logistically for you? You had to fly out of, it sounds like you're from Minnesota, Wisconsin, feels like you're in the Midwest central, central part of, of, of America. You had to go to probably fly out of your local city to a larger city to another, like how many, how was your travel? Was it, was it two flights? Was it three flights? And, and, and did all your gear make it? So I drove from Northeast Iowa to Chicago where Alex and Lori are at. And then I actually picked them up and we drove to the Chicago airport um, and had uh, um, their significant others um, drop us off and pick us back up. Um, John uh, left from Minneapolis and then met us in Chicago. So we were all on the same flight from there. Um, you know, going through the airport with a bike box and, you know, gear and backpacks and everything else is definitely an experience. There's a lot of gear. Um, I used to race bikes, so I'm really familiar with carrying bikes, um, in airports, but I a hundred percent feel that flying internationally with bicycles is so much easier than flying domestically with bikes. Say more about that. It's free. For one thing, um, so domestically uh, or within the U.S., you have to pay a lot more. It's just a lot more hassle. If mm-hmm. you fly internationally, and we you we only had two bags. I think John had three because he had a paddle bag. But we had our gear, and then we had our box, um, our bike box. Uh, Jamie found these bike box things, bikesbox.com, I think, which are the best bicycle boxes I ever used um, because they were corrugated plastic. So it's almost like a cardboard box, but it's plastic. They were beautiful. All four of us got them. Um, And so we we looked like a team, which was awesome. It was really nice to be all coordinated. These were black bike boxes. So they look very professional to me. Were they the same Uh, bike boxes you used during the race? Yes, we use those during the race also. Um, they, they're great. Like I would, I would talk about them all the time for now on because they're such great bike boxes coming from someone who's traveled a ton with them. Mm-hmm. Um, but then, uh, that's the kind of thing that we coordinate in our calls, which I think was critical because we all bought the same bike boxes. We all bought the same flight, um, so that we all could arrive together. And I think that helped us a lot too, right. um, to, so we could talk a lot more, um, in person. How far in advance of the race did you land in the, on the race uh, site? A day, maybe. Yeah, um, it was like a day and a half. Yeah. And a half. The race was um, the race directors uh, were there to me. I think it was the race directors there meeting us. There was a whole welcoming committee at the airport to pick us up and shuttle us to uh, the place where we stayed the first night. Gotcha. Um, that where'd, was, you, where'd you fly into? What airport? Uh, Florianopolis. Florianopolis. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, we had a connection in Sao Paulo, and then um, to Florianopolis from there. So um, that whole that whole scenario was so easy for us um, to have somebody yeah. actually waiting at the airport for us and ready to just take us there. They had somebody there who could speak English. And um, that was also great. They There were a handful of people um, on the within the race, um, the organization committee that um, that could speak English. So they and everyone knew who those people were. So they go get us. <laughs> gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah, because cool. you were your lone American team. They knew you need special consideration. So everyone yeah. was looking out for you. For, for both us as well as the Denmark, the yeah, the Denmark team as well. Um, the right. only language they had in common was English as well. 
Gotcha. Um, so they had people with um, also had people speaking Spanish as well for the um, Colombian and uh, Uruguay teams. Right. And by yeah. the way, isn't it just we'll, we'll come back? Is this the coolest thing when you're there and it's like these different teams and languages? You know, we I put a picture up. Um, one of the teams that finished extras knows our four countries were represented. My comment was the real United Nations. Like how cool, like you go to these faraway races and it's like Denmark and it's like Spanish speaking, Portuguese speaking, English speaking. It's just, it's just the, it's the coolest thing. I thought, give me a moment there, folks. I appreciate you humoring me while I say that. I just think that is the coolest thing about adventure racing. Um, so they, did oh, that. John. they actually had flags for all the country participants. And I think I want to say they said it was 17 flags, which is a great. lot. Yeah. yeah. That's a big ARWS thing. They always insist on having the parade of nations. They like that. They like when you walk around with the flags and show them off. Yeah. So the, the one thing that I, I would want to add for beginning or, or teams just going to an international race for the first time. The one thing that I learned when I first started to pack, I, to, to leave, I was packing for the race. And what I learned to do was pack for the airport. And what I mean by that is, like there are certain things you can't take in your carry-on luggage, like batteries or yep. whatever your airport restrictions. So like know your airport restrictions and pack your bags in accordance with the airport because you have time. You're going to repack. You're going to throw. I mean, we unpacked and packed so many times. It wasn't even funny. So it's really not. It's critical that you make sure that you have everything before you leave. But pack it however is going to get you through the airline. Don't worry about what goes in your backpack versus what goes in your bike box because it's all going to change anyway. Right. It's just, it's, yeah, the, 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 the logistics of the gear you carry, the lithium ion batteries, the things you have, the, all the wires you have, like, you know, without fail, we always get stopped at every checkpoint because we've, we've, we've bags full of batteries and wires, right? So you're having conversations with people with badges. They tend to bring you right through. Um, and so, and so it, it took you a while to get there, you know, and we're now almost 20 minutes into the podcast, not even at, not even at the race yet, but that's what you get when you race internationally, right? You, you sit there. What did you do in advance of the race when it came to nutrition? Did you eat the local food? Did you eat things that were cooked, that were fresh? Were you concerned about your stomach getting there? Like so some, some teams and because it's, it's not as much that the food is not going to be good. The food's just going to be different. And they don't want to throw a curveball into their, into their their upper GI tract going into a race. Did you have any considerations about that, or did you just have at it and just go for it as soon as you landed? I uh, so uh, the place that we were staying had a buffet style uh, meal situation, and everything was labeled in Portuguese. Um, so I just looked everything up and learned the words for food. Um, so I was like, okay, now I know what kind of meat I'm eating. I learned what uh, farofa is. Um, it's like a cassava <laughs> powder. It's really good. Um, I put it on my beans. I don't know. Um, but really just just understanding like, you know, where is the dairy? Like, where are the things that I can't eat? <laughs> and, gotcha. um, making sure I know how to avoid that. Um, gotcha. So for me, it's it's really just like try all the things, understand what, what meat is what. And, um, you know, YOLO. Gotcha. Just go for it. Right. Yeah. I mean, when I was in Ecuador, I was thoughtful about before the race because I didn't want to mess my teammates up. When the race was over, I was like, bring it on more plates, figure it out. And, you know, so, it, it, it was fantastic. Yeah. So as you can see, and well, I'm sure we'll talk about it more. So Lori was our translator okay. uh, because Lori spoke some, some Spanish and learned to speak Portuguese quickly, um, Portuguese slash Spanish. Uh, me personally, I, I didn't care. I ate everything on the, on the local economy. It, it, it just I have traveled abroad before. So I wasn't, but I relied on Lori. I was like, Lori, what, is, what am I eating? And she's like, it's okay. Uh, and so I, <laughs> as long as Lori told me it was okay, I ate it. Um, For it, John, just chew it. You're fine. Yeah, You're fine. Yeah, I just, I, but, you know, I, and I do understand that it, like, more as we go on to the race, one thing that I was surprised about is I, I during the actual race itself, I ate almost entirely off the local economy versus what I had in my backpack. I wish I had packed a lot less. Because I ended up dumping food because we were eating so much on the local economy. Interesting. So let, let's uh, let's dive into the race, right? It sounds like so you get there, you're fine, you have your gear. First off, kudos on having it sounds like a pretty smooth trip, like no bikes left behind, bags left behind things. So clearly you're racing under a star, right? So so well done there. Um what time, how how long this is a perennial question of venture racing, how soon before the race did you get your maps? 
About two hours, maybe. Okay, two hours. And two how many hours. maps? How many maps did they give you? Uh, I think there's four or five. Okay. Yeah. Okay. One one main big one, and then uh, like four supplementals. And that were those the maps for the entire race? Yes. Wow. So so a uh, uh, a five hundred kilometer race. Now the maps were huge, though. Am I correct? I mean, the maps it was like yeah. a blanket. Yes. Right. So it was one map, but it's like a joke, right? It's like it's like a, it's a map the size of a Buick, right? So it's okay. So you win, guys. It's one map. Um, <laughs> did you find the map quality to be markedly? Did you have to do a lot of adjustment for maps you were used to racing in the states? Their maps were phenomenal. Okay. Um, I mean, one thing, crazy. one thing that we didn't think about was the scale, um, and yeah. we uh, were used to um, navigating on one to twenty. One to twenty-four. One to right. twenty-four. <laughs> um, this was one to fifty. One to yeah, one to fifty. Wow. To 50. Okay, so that's so, um, big. yeah. So that, like having to change your brain on like what is one click, what is one right. square, um, that uh, that threw us off a little bit. Okay. okay. In hindsight, that seems like such a rookie mistake, but it did throw us off for the, yeah. until we discovered it. It's like, oh my god, now that's why it was so hard the first you know half day or the last section. Yeah, because you thought because um, with it being so much bigger you thought you were you were covering different distances and you had to realize we're not there yet we're not here okay okay yeah and none of us have raised with metric maps before okay okay so there's just a lot there's a lot of early race adjustment you had to make to scale the maps the metric maps but to your point and it was nice to hear that that the maps were, were very good they were spot on they were accurate because oh, that, you know we've had people race all over the world and they're like listen these maps were written in crayon it sounds like you had really really good maps yeah the, the maps were phenomenal but remember not only had we not like we had not seen maps one over fifty thousand. i remember first time we jumped in pack grass was the first time we'd ever seen pack grass before oh interesting oh we never saw a pack grass till the day of the race Wow. And, you know, we were we were commenting on the pack grass, how they all look so great. We, and I'm like, where did they get those great pack grass? And then Rob Howard pointed out to me that he wrote an article where they said that the guys own a pack raft company. Right, they I'm own like, a pack raft company. Yeah, and and should... by the way, so I'm an avid kayaker. Right. So pack rafts are incredible from this standpoint. They're yeah. incredibly stable. Yes. They paddle like a tug barge. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Um, they're not, they're not, but I mean, they're incredibly stable craft. Yep. Um, but you... You really, it, I mean, we figured it out the first leg, um, but they they paddle. You're not good. They're not as slick as a kayak. No, no. It's just it, they're not. Or a canoe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so, uh, so I have no, I oh. have very little. The only kayak experience I have is during an adventure race. Usually they're set atop those bathtub kayaks, and I have no canoe experience. And so I'm all pack rafting, and I, I do here in the Northeast of, of, of America, we take the pack rafts onto rivers and pretty high class water. So we're all pack rafters. So I have no context to that, but people I know who go from other types of boats in the pack rafts are like, this is terrible. You feel like a dragon, to your point, like you're dragging a barge around. It's that kind of, so that was your first time in a pack raft was the race. Now the pack raft you used at the start, and, and now we're going to kind of get into the race a little bit, right? So you have to kind of wake in your brain of the different sections. The pack raft you used at the start, was that your pack raft for the race? Or did when you got to the other side of that pack raft, you left it there and you picked up a different one? Or did oh, they no, we carried it. They, so but they assigned you a pack raft in the beginning. That was, was our pack raft for the first day. First yeah. day, okay. First day, uh, what, first day and a half, Lori, because we carried it. Um, okay. Yeah, no, we carried it. We had uh, we pack rafted and then we packed it. We packed the raft. Right. Um, and hauled it over the over the hill. And then we pack rafted again, but then we dropped it at the at the first TA. Gotcha. Okay. Um, so 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 let, let's walk through the stages, right? So for those who are home, if you go to the, the, the Malakara Facebook page, what a beautiful start, right? I mean, I think you were in a bay and you had to go to walk us through the prologue, walk us through the first stage. So the first stage was a pack rafting stage. Uh, you, we started uh, right underneath that uh, that big bridge. Um, we had a uh, pack raft cross that bay. A couple of checkpoints on uh, that bay. Um, we came uh, back around to the mainland um, from, or sorry, we were back on the island, um, which is called Magic Island. And then we had to pack raft and basically go up over the mountain into this uh, interior land lake um, there. A lot of that pack raft was, or a lot of that trek portion of that pack raft was kind of through what we would call the jungle. A lot of vines, uh, you know, steep inclines. 
Um, it was definitely interesting. I think there's several pictures out there of uh, John with paddles sticking straight up out of his pack. And it was, you know, basically one person was telling, you know, telling John, okay, duck, duck, left, left, right, right, around all the vines and branches. And we kind of paired off and there was a lot of teamwork to get through all of that because there was a lot of low line uh, branches and stuff. From there, then we got back into the pack raft and paddled across this like interior lake. Uh, a couple of checkpoints there. And then there was a little short, I don't know, maybe a couple of kilometer long river um, that we hit luckily when the tide was going out. So the water was flowing the correct direction for us. Um, that section, we all, we were maybe, I don't know, a couple hundred yards from going out to sea. We missed our takeout and wow. had a bunch, okay. of people, bunch of people in the park, you know, yelling at us, stop, stop, you know, in Portuguese. And we're like waving at them like, Hey, yeah. Uh, right. we realized what was going on. Bye guys. <laughs> the Coast Guard right behind you. <laughs> uh, so that, and then that was the first TA, um, there. Um, so that was basically the first day. How did you find the weather? hot and hot. oh yeah tropical right i mean you're in hot. brazil right it's going to be hot and it's going to be 90 plus and 90 percent humidity what did, yeah. you, what did you do for water did you source it down there did you filter it uh we treated what we could um we we started with you know bottled water um and you know whatever we had brought with us and um as the race progressed we um we were just filling up at taps as we could find them um filling up in streams um, and treating it. Uh, we have had a lot of very silty water, but it was clean. Got it. <laughs> Anybody have any, any post-race uh, stomach issues due to the water or the food? No. Nope. I, I think we're missing... lucky that way. I think yeah. we're lucky, but I also think we were really good about only tr drinking treated water. And um, yeah. that like throughout, you know, any water coming from any tap we treated, um, that was what the locals told us to do. They said, the water is fine for us, but you're American, so please treat it. Yeah, because it's not there. Okay, and how, when now getting nitty gritty, how did you treat it? Was it was it? Did you filter it there? Did you put in iodine pills? Like, what was your treatment strategy? Um, uh, Aquatabs for us. I think John was in school. Yeah, so iodine. they made fun of me because I went with old fashioned iodine. Okay, um, and they went with the more high speed chlorine tablets. Which, by the way, I learned taste a lot better than than um, yeah. than, the, than the old fashioned iodine. But either one works. But so so. For me, what they were talking about, like one of the things that I had to get adjusted to, and it's just the way the race went. So when I left Minnesota, it was, I think I'm remembering back, it was like seven degrees. And we had and we had 36 inches of snow on the ground. I arrived in Brazil and it was the equivalent of like 86 degrees. So it was a big change for me. It's like an 80 degree um, temperature swing. I mean, yeah. that's that's from, from a, a body perspective, acclimatizing that is brutal. Because well, obviously and, elevation's not an issue because you're on the ocean. Yeah. Yeah. Elevation, well, I mean, we did I do want to go back to and I apologize. I'm also a track coach. So and I was yelling at my kids all day. That's why my voice sounds as horrible as it does. Yeah, but but going back to Jamie's point, I will say this. I think that we I was I was incredible. I was amazed. I thought we did a phenomenal job of quickly adapting and helping each other out because what he was talking about, like, for example, you know, whether it was Lori in front of me or Alex in front of me, having someone in front of you, and it sounds so dumb sitting here in your living room, but having someone in front of you going duck, move mm -hmm. left, move right. It, it really made things a lot better. I mean, I mean, seriously, like it, it sounds crazy, but there it made perfect sense. I mean, and Lori was constantly like, I, we kind of can like I. It was kind of like leading one of those oversized semis on the highway. Uh, that's kind of like our entire walking force. <laughs> <laughs> they coming at you and it's like they're really they're like yeah. a lane and a half and they're yeah. really wide. But the well, yellow lights are going. <laughs> we were carrying two. We had two pack rafts. So Alex was carrying one of them or the paddles on, on one of them. So right. two, we had two people who were excessively tall compared to what they're used to. Yeah, they're all of a sudden they're eight feet tall. Right. Yeah. So Alex was carrying one, but Alex is also not. A tall person. Sorry, Alex. Um, so, so Jamie, Jamie paired up with Alex, and Jamie walking behind Alex, he could see what she was about to hit, so he could just walk behind her and spot. For me, I'm short, and John is tall, and John is also carrying the paddles because right. my pack was weird and wouldn't hold them well. So, 
I had to go in front and then like run up in front and then turn around real quick and be like, okay, John, I got you. And then I was, so I was spotting him from, from front. It was. Uh, so did, did you find frustration with that rate of travel? No, was it-, but it was actually hysterical because she did that for eight hours. Eight hours. Okay. And that was day one. Yeah. 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 The thing, I mean, it, we were we accepted that we weren't going to go fast. And it was one of those where let's just get through this, guys. Right, and yeah. so we were going at that pace and we were fine because we it was fine. And, and to when, your point earlier, when we, because, when we like, finished the, when we finished that trek, though, there was a restaurant right at the bottom that had bottles of Coca-Cola. We were all we were fine. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> finding it. Finding a bottle, a cold bottle of soda on a race course is heaven. So how. So now I'm looking I'm looking at the map as we're talking here. And and clearly it sounds like that first stage was right along the water. You were literally along the ocean there. And I see where you got on. You almost got blown out into the ocean. And I see all that here. You then went from that. So you, it was a pack raft to a trek down the coast back yeah. to the pack raft for the inland lake. And then you got in that river. And then you went a little west, and it sounds like there was a mountain bike section that you transitioned to the mountain bikes. And I think on their map they call it eight. Their their TAs are actually ATs. So yeah. AT three yeah. was the um, the mountain bike section you picked up. That's and a that's so, a very loose term. <laughs> on on, on AT three, just so that we uh, have the timeline. So and in TA three was actually where I was getting pretty sick. Okay. Uh, I was pretty dehydrated. Uh, I couldn't keep any food or water down. Um, and I had gone close to seven or eight hours uh, without being able to hold anything down. Mm, and that's I, rough. I actually ended up dropping out of the race at TA3. Okay. Okay. It was, just, it was just it was just too much. It, yeah. It, it, I, it wasn't good. I couldn't hold anything down. Right. Um, it took me about a day after that. What I learned in hindsight for and for new uh, racers is I was only running electrolytes, but I was running more of like a, a calorie replacement. And gotcha. I was only in that in about 25% of my water and I was drinking straight water. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And in when it's that hot, especially, you've got to use electrolytes in 100% of what you drink. Yeah, yeah. And that's a lesson I learned the hard way. So basically what happened was you threw, you threw your electrolyte imbalance off. Your body couldn't process all the water coming through it. So the water's got to go somewhere. If you can't go yeah. in your system, it comes out of your system. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, 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 good on you, by the way, for making a safety decision, right? And, and you know, making a decision to, to, to pull out of a race is hard, right? You do the preparation, you do the prep, you go through all of that. You have three people relying upon you. And from what I'm looking at here and, and for, the, for the folks who continue with the race, it looks like that, that mountain bike section got pretty gnarly, right? You went inland. It sounds like you were in the jungle. And by the way, for those at home, as I said that, all three heads shook as I, as I brought that up. So I, I do want to- It wasn't mountain one. biking. Yeah. Let's just be clear. <laughs> we had our right. mountain bikes with us, but it was, it was a, not mountain biking. It was a hiker yeah. bike. I, but I do want to point out one thing that, because it's going to come back later on as we're talking. So I was very impressed that the race directors allowed the three of us to race on. So the race directors told the three of us that we can race on with the understanding when we got to the final pack raft section that we might not be able to do it because we only had three people in two pack rafts. But now in my story time, I'm going to call this foreshadowing because something's going to change that during the race. Um, that's going to change the whole course of that. Got it. So I, I want to point out this little foreshadowing moment because as so we had to drop Jamie and we were sad to drop Jamie. But Lori and Alex and I headed out into parts unknown. Um, we had a glorious first, what, 20 kilometers, Alex, Lori, or so. And then we hit Brazilian mud. And I'll let them continue the story from there. Yeah. So it rained the day before. And okay. uh, and we were we were basically, I, when I review my, my GoPro videos, uh, we claim we think that we went 250 meters horizontally as well as vertically um, in our first big, big climb there. <laughs> um, it was it felt like it was straight up. Um, we don't there were not a lot of switchbacks in any of the climbs that we had. Um, everything was really, really steep. Yeah, um, that's that's a, a interesting. I've seen that before. Yeah, there's no, there's no zigzag. They don't have snow. I don't know. But yeah, like you go straight up and you go straight down. Yep. Yeah. yeah. They straight up, straight down. They called it a motorcycle trail. And so I don't even know how motorcycles could go up and down that because there is definite washout in, you know, and ruts and things like that. Um, it was all the red sticky mud. So it would stick on your tires. Peanut so butter, tire then your drive chain. 
Yep. Yep. You're you're clearing mud off of your uh, front tires, rear tires at every rotation. So basically, so you're, just, you're basically just dragging around. You're, you're dragging around a thirty pound piece of metal. Yeah. Right. That's what it boils oh, down no, to. You're dragging around a fifty pound because pound, pound. of mud and everything. You're right. You're right. Okay. <laughs> and, okay. And, we and that's a bit. And that's a big section, by the way. Yeah. We so it was about we tried different things. So one, we tried like leaving our packs at say like the base of a steep incline getting the bikes up and coming back and getting the packs so that we didn't have everything on our back. That was more efficient. I mean, it was like easier to move the bikes, but it was less efficient because it took us twice as much yeah. energy to slide back down the mountain. Right. Then we tried changing bikes, like pushing the bike halfway up and then changing and then pushing the bike halfway up. And that was fairly, uh, the bottom line is, I guess the point that I'm trying to make is you just got to keep trying doing different things yeah. because everything in mud sucks. There's just no way around it. Yeah, there's so no, there's no good news. There's no, there's no good news. And all you're doing is you're, you're changing your strategy to at least put a different mental model on there, right? Just doing yeah. it differently, because otherwise it's brutal. Yeah, okay. So, and, and like you were talking about the story, so like the one thing that I will tell you, and and Lori and Alex know this, but it was, it was in the middle of the night. It was probably like 1 a.m. And this is something that I will tell you that I think is amazing about adventure racing. But I'm like going up this steep incline. I fall down. My bike falls on top of me. At this point, I'm just ready to say my goodbyes to my friends and family and die in the mud. This has been great. Good luck, everybody. My bike's laying on top of me. And and this Brazilian man, like another racer, actually picks my bike up off my chest. He's like, you're okay. He's like, and he's like, he carried my bike up the incline, comes back down, gives me a piece of candy and then he apologizes that he doesn't speak english and i'm like dude i want to hug you right now that's all i care about because you got my bike to the top and then they disappeared into the night but that to me the thing was he saw another team that was kind of and it was a really steep really tricky section right and alex and lori had just a matter of fact i think lori was i don't remember if lori was behind me or in front of me but they they kind of like i think they like I don't know. They sensed that we just needed help. And they were young, 21, 22 year olds. I mean, I'm a 54 year old guy. And, right. um, and they, they, but that's how adventure racing works. Right. Oh yeah. All the time. Right. You never, yeah. I mean, you know, even at the, even at the, the pointy end of the race up front teams, they race hard, but they're going to help somebody else out along the way. We we've had that multiple times in races and, and it's amazing how you meet people in that experience. You share a large chunk of the race together and you bond over it and you end up racing with them at a future race. Like we had this experience. So to your point, they came back, they got you, they gave you candy, they rescued you, and off you went. Now, on the race maps, that was a really long biking section. Like, really long. So are we now at the end of day one? You get you race through the night, it sounds like? No, we're at the end of day three. Three. Day three. Yeah. We're at the end of day three. So how, now, so how and, long were you on that biking section? So we were on that bike. So we pushed our bikes. Lori, or Alex, correct. We pushed our bikes for at least seventeen hours. Yeah, yeah I think like we 20, no yeah, twenty two hours. Lost yeah, over. It was, yeah, it was like we lost hours. over the second hike, the second trekking section that went down the beach. Yep. Yeah. Okay. That's what we grant. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So what we haven't actually talked about was the the trek between TA one. That's right. To TA three. Two to three. Got two. Yeah. Two. Um. Yeah, the track. It sounds like it was, it was right down the ocean. Yeah, we slept the first night. We slept on the beach. Well, we woke up to a surfing competition. It was great. Was it actually uh, happening, or were you hallucinating? Uh, no, they were <laughs> they were warming up. Um, okay, we, we made friends with the security guard. No, we slept on the stage on the finishing stage where they were going to hand out the awards and everything. <laughs> <laughs> they showed up there like who were these people? It was like they're walking around you. They're putting no, lights on. There was a security guard there but and yeah. he just kind of waved and we just kind of laid down well, and we... I, I had a good conversation with him this is this is me like figuring out how to talk to people <laughs> throughout brazil um but yeah he and i had a great conversation and he was like i'm safe and you can sleep here and it's fine okay so like, all right so, i trust you yeah so the brazilians are nothing like the americans from the standpoint so adventuration is very big in brazil mm -hmm. so like for example um after, you know, after we got done with the muddy bike section and we actually got back on our bikes and we were kind of like going up and down. But anyway, that next night we ended up sleeping 
and, and like the back porch of like some person's house yeah. where another team was sleeping. And that was perfectly acceptable. Yeah. We learned that many people do that in Brazil yep. and nobody was like American. We, they would have probably like ran you off their property. Yeah. In Brazil, that's expected. It's like we like and throughout the course of the race, we went through several pieces of private property where we moved cow fencing and we had to put it back. And because that was part of the race. I mean, the race directors had arranged it that way. But that's just how the Brazilian yep. people work. That I will say this, the Brazilian people, every Brazilian person we met along the way was nice. It, it, like the, the culture and the people were amazing. We had that when in Ecuador, we had an injured teammate. It was, you know, just pouring rain, two in the morning. There was eight of us, just two teams that kind of formed a super team. We were with a, a team of American Ecuadorian team on the other side. And we had a guy that was hurt. And it was literally, it was one of these things. It was like 40 degrees and pouring rain. Everyone was cold, shivering. It was like day four. Um, and we just walked into someone's garage and just basically set up camp. Eight of us set up camp. And the owner came walking out and someone explained to the owner that we were racers, a uh, Carrera, right? We were racers and... And they were like, okay, no problem. And they left and we ended up staying behind myself and a teammate for the for the medical to come get us. And we just sat in this garage and they, God bless them. Whereas, I mean, Expedition Ozark, there was some significant concern about traveling on private property and the results of that, if that were to happen, right? And so you're right that there's definitely that. Um, as, as I look here at the map, I'm noticing at the end of that, of that long bike section, a whole collection of flags. Did you put the bikes down and do an orienteering section or, uh, a trekking section to get back okay. on the bikes? Okay. We did not. So, and I'm going to let like Lori and Alex get you like back on track. So what happened is because, th because we had gotten behind like in, in a buddy section. And, and one point I was going to make about this is, this is one of the things I love about adventure racing and expedition racing is race directors expect you and they they trust you that you can make decisions on your own. Right. Right. Okay, so we made a decision and and so and we decided that we were going to go and Alex and Lori, I'm gonna let so please keep me honest. We we needed it, we need to get resupply. So we decided to go into a town, but we decided that we were gonna go into TA six. Is that correct? I'll, I'll let Lori tell it. She can she had the map at this point. Yeah. So, yeah, we, we decided that going all, all the way west to TA4 slash TA5 was not going to be feasible for us to get back to our stuff in, in a, any reasonable amount of time. Gotcha. We, instead of going west, we turned north. We I saw on the map that there, were, there was a thing that looked like a town. So I was like, I bet that's a town. We can stop. We can regroup. Um, that's halfway there. It looks like there's a bunch of paved roads. It'll be a, like a reasonable ride to get up there. Um, and so that's what we did. We turned north and we went to the town. It was, I can't remember the name anymore. Um, starts with the sow. Uh, <laughs> but uh, they, yeah, we, so what, what happened is that we, you know, we rolled, we were ended up biking through this area that kind of felt like the wine country. It was like nice rolling hills and very idyllic uh, green pastures. And it was just beautiful. Um, we rolled into the town and uh, found the central park of the city, we found a bakery and uh <laughs> we're able to really eat and and regroup and um in the shade and i feel like it really brought some new life back to us yeah so it sounds like what you i mean to your point adventure race directors <clears throat> they they know who they're dealing with here and they let you they left you alone enough to figure that out as i look at your track here clearly to have to a state further west would have been you'd be out there for days and days and days right because the mud just slowed you down and there's that. So you basically went north and you went into TA six, <clears throat> cutting out a large with the western section of the course. You left that alone, but the adventure continued because you had a chance to refuel. You had a chance to take care of yourself and, and stay on the course. Um, nothing is worse than uh, having to get transported, right? They come so, to get you. Yeah. Well, so that's where uh, that's <laughs> right, but that's where we, more. If, if I feel like like this is more foreshadowing right there. Go ahead, keep yeah, going. But no, but that is where we like the biggest like. They, so eating off the local economy, so uh, there's nothing against protein bars and goo, and you just knock yourself out. But until you've had like carne pastry, when you're right. dying, and all of a sudden you like go into this, and, and my, my point that I was going to make is, so Lori's ability to speak enough of the language and to find a cafe, it really, really recharges us. So we kind of set in the town square, and just kind of dried our stuff out for a little bit. But we ate this really, really fabulous, like pastry 
me, I, I just cannot tell you how much it revived both like from a yeah. nutrition, but more than anything, it just revives your soul. Right, right. And you're in civilization, you feel good, you're getting a little dry, maybe your socks and shoes off. And that's like, you know, for the newer racer, right? Huge piece of advice is if you have a chance to stop somewhere and you take your socks and shoes off, get to get your feet dry, get back out there. And eating the natural food, uh, empanadas in a little town in Ecuador were just the greatest thing ever, right? And, you know, eight racers, 16 empanadas, and off we went. Yeah, well, and, and my point, and then I went Alex and Lloyd because they were, had the map at this point. But my, my point to me would be like to new racers, and we talked about this a little bit before the race, you're going to have extreme lows in your race. Right. And you're going to have extreme highs. When you have extreme lows, rely on your teammates and don't quit. Right. Because right. you're going to get back to that. And to me, I was feeling pretty low. Um, and then we got into that town and it was like a re it was like a restart. It, it really like, you know, it, it, you're going to have highs and lows throughout the race, but don't, don't get down on yourselves when you get low because there's a high point coming. Right. And that's the most the thing common thing. Also, I, I want it totally true at an hour, two hours taking a break is nothing in a six day race. Right. And it might feel like, Oh my God, we're just sitting here doing nothing. You might be feeling good, but if right. you've got a teammate that might not be feeling just quite good yet to keep going, just wait another 15 minutes, wait another hour. Cause right. that's nothing in the long term thing. And then when you actually do go, your, your tank is that much fuller. So well, to, to your point, you could, it's all balanced, right? If you, if you get out there too quickly and you get back on the course, you're leaving some rest behind. If you stay there too long, you're burning through time. So it's finding that magic formula to do that. But you're right. In a, in a, in a six day race, what's another 15, 20 minutes, especially. And I think that I think to the point, the team, because you had spoken beforehand and you were during the race, it sounds like you were you were you were traveling the adventure together. Right. You were making adjustments along the way. You were continuing on the course. It was about really getting a sense out of the whole the race course. And so therefore, you didn't feel like while yeah. you were racing, you were able to catch your breath and do things that were more important for your own health. We definitely, I think as a team, maybe it was the calls beforehand when we arrived, we all brought something to the team. So we all had really good respect for each other. Gotcha. So we might have felt really good at one point, but we knew, hey, if John's not feeling good or if Lori or if Alex is not feeling good, right. there must be something that's not quite right yet. Let's wait. Gotcha. It wasn't one of those where someone was impatient. So that, I think we're all really lucky about How that. How did you do with the sleep? What was your sleep? What was your sleeping like? So, but for, I, I do want to go back. And the other thing I want to say though is trust your teammates mm -hmm. because there was there was like one time I remember I was like I really need to rest and Lori was like the town is two hours away and I was like okay like and you know what I mean I mean it's just that little trust of going okay you know so you know you know what I mean like like I I wanted to rest but at the same time they're like the town is two hours away we can rest there and I was like okay I can push for another two hours. You know, even if it was, you know, two and a half hours, close enough. But you know what I mean? I mean, right. my point, my point is, is having that trust in your teammates. Um, and, 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 it, and it really helps. And, you know, sometimes like they'll like come back, whether it was somebody coming back and telling me, hey, we got this. You only got another two hours or, you know, me pedaling up to Lori and be like, all right, we got this. You know, we only got two more hills to go up and we're done with this thing. Um, you know, but. And then I'll let you, I'll let them talk about sleep, but our first night of rest was hilarious. <laughs> yeah. I wasn't sure uh, how I was going to handle the sleep. Cause I'm a person who at, in a previous race fell asleep, leaning against a tree. Okay. Um, you standing up. I was just like, I guess that that's what I do. Um, so I, I had no idea what I was in for, for this one. Um, uh, but it turns out like we ended up getting three ish hours a night, maybe less at uh, times. The first night of sleep was on a beach. Um, the second night of sleep, I think, was at a TA. Oh. Um, and and that was when um, that was when we weren't sure what was happening with Jamie. So um, we got a little bit more time, at least, of rest there, even if we weren't sleeping. Okay. Uh, but in general, yeah. what we did was, if somebody was like, "I need to stop now," we just stopped. Yeah. And we pulled out our bags and we slept for as long as we could. I found that I kept waking up first because I was cold. So it, we probably were only ever sleeping more, well, maybe an hour or two. But. Gotcha. So, so two things. So one, the, the, so the, so we did, but the night after we slept in the TA, we started to make the long push towards TA four or five when we had, so we, fi so finally, like we were all pretty exhausted. 
And Alex was like, I've got to get some sleep. Uh, so she's like, okay, find us a place to sleep. And I found this like mossy like area. And I was like, all right. And I never forget that Alex was like, we're going to sleep there. <laughs> um, because it was like literally like two feet off the trail. But it gets better for the standpoint. I was like, and she's like, okay. She's like, I trust you all. So we go down and it's like, it's like, I think about like, it was only, it was like eight o'clock at night because I remember Lori woke me up at nine o'clock at night and I had on a dumb watch because we all had to switch to dumb watches. So I just got on like a Timex watch and, and I looked at my watch and it was nine o'clock. I was like, okay, can we, and in my mind, I was like, for the next two hours, I was like, why isn't the sun coming up? Because I literally thought it was 9 a.m. Okay, and I finally yeah. asked Alex, and I was like, Alex, where is the sun? And she's like, it's 10 o'clock, you idiot. And I was well, like, and what oh. day was this? Was this day four or five? Yeah, this was like day four and a half. Yeah. Right. This was and you, and you were on the course for how many days total? Uh, six. Five, five and a half, five, I think. Five and, five and a half. And a half. Uh, Round, round up to six, right? So that's yep. a lot. So, so you're 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 away long enough to have like like almost like a full week passes, and you were just inside that little world. And I'm assuming no outside contact with the world during that time. You were just this self sustaining unit yep. making your way through Brazil. And yep. I'm sitting back at the hotel, what dot watching, right? And the dots, the tracker stopped. So I had no idea where they were, other than that they had mentioned that they might try to take a shortcut before they left TA3. And so I was actually pretty darn nervous because I'm watching all the stuff on ARWS and all the teams that are coming in and yeah. not, no, not my team, not my team. I'm like, where? Well, that's what got, it was interesting because that's what got me interested in interviewing all of you, aside the fact that you're an American team and I was curious about your experience was it, it's, it, you could tell that you had a heck of a time out there. Right. And that it was really, and you really got your money's worth out of the course with your, your five and a half days out there and all of that. Oh, absolutely. And then we rolled into, so what we ended up deciding to do is go to TA6. So we shot for TA6. And this is where my foreshadowing comes in. Right. Because we get into TA6. And so along the course, we had ran into this uh, um, Brazilian lady named Camilla. Camilla. I can never, I still can't say her name, right? Lori knows how to say her name. But anyway, she was in TA6 and her team had quit, but she didn't want to quit. So the race directors let her join our team. But Alex had to build her a bike because her bike was broken. So Alex took bikes from wait, 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 wait. other bikes. We got to back it up. We got to back it up. Oh, okay. Okay. So. Rolling into TA6, yes. Alex broke her bike up at the top of the hill. Oh, that's right, because right, I towed her in. At the top of a 16-kilometer descent. How <laughs> lucky. If you're going to break your bike, right, do it from top of your 16 oh. Yeah, so she coasted down the hill. Uh, John move, Alex. Her from last, like, yeah, John towed her for the last quarter mile, I think. But then but we, when we rolled into TA6, we look up, and there's Camila. And she stands up, she goes... My team! And she runs over and gives us a big hug. And then she tells us to go shower, of course. Um, and then, uh, but it was great. We had time to, to clean up. We ate some food. And yeah, then basically Alex just Frankenstein together her broken bike with Camila's broken bike to make one bike. And then we stole Jamie's bike, which had been traveling along. In the That's bike. right, because I was there. You still had the bike waiting for you. <laughs> yeah. That was great. So the, we were a team of four, and my the best part of that was that we had a translator on our team after that. Right. It was well, amazing. That, yeah, yeah, so big great deal. English. We had a translator. So the second so much half better at it than me. Oh, so my gosh. Much. Yeah. yeah. It's and amazing. You pick, you pick a local up, things get a lot easier. So Alex oh, built this Frankenstein bike, <laughs> but it squeaked every oh, five meters. Oh. It was hysterical. She, she couldn't stop pedaling. She had to constantly pedal. If she, yeah. if she stopped pedaling, it would just be just screaming. And it was like, I don't know, 1 a.m. or so going through a town. Oh, so, uh, adventure racing, now. living the dream. <laughs> <laughs> I think I had an air horn on my bike rolling through town, 1 oh, o'clock in the oh, morning. Oh, yeah, I was going to say, but our dream gets better because, like they said, so we're like navigating through this town. And we get to TA6. And we actually, oh no, TA7, right? Yeah, so we get to TA7, right, Lori? That was the final pack raft. Yeah. 
And we actually got some sleep in TA7. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we did. Um, uh, <laughs> the volunteers had some very nice droney music and uh, the songs from that from that playlist that they were sleeping to uh, now forever will remind me of this race. It's great. Um, but yeah, we, uh, and yeah, we, we, we slept well, we woke up in the morning and, and we, we hauled off and we we're like, all right, full day of paddling. Let's get up at sunrise. Cause that sounds like a great experience. I, and you knew, and you knew it was a paddle to the finish. So you were, yeah. you, you could smell the barn five yeah. days. You knew it was coming in front of you and you had, you had your fourth, you had Camilla, you had the fourth teammate, right? Do you remember, do you remember her last name, by the way? I can tell I you. Okay. But, but I want Lori to tell the story of what happened on the ocean. Oh yeah, that was yeah. So okay, so uh, so we started the day with a long like river float, uh, basically down um, down back to this large open uh, open bay that separates the mainland from Magic yep. Island, and um, Camila Guarita, by the way. Gotcha. Guarita is her last name. Um, so. Uh, so when, as we were kind of paddling down, we realized we're like, oh, there's a current we can just like raft up. <laughs> so we didn't, we didn't work too hard on, uh, when we had the current working with us and it was a really nice morning float. Mm -hmm. Um, it felt very vacation-y. Um, but, uh, but then when we got out onto the open water, um, you know, we, we first go, we, uh, the, one of the first checkpoints was next to a restaurant and it was 10 30 AM and Camila's like, you know. I bet we can get them. We can get them to, to make us some food. So she convinced them to open up early, um, fry us up some fish. We had a really delightful lunch, watching other teams come through and hit the checkpoint. We we invited them to eat with us, but they're like, "We're gonna go finish the race." Right? Yeah. Why rush? Uh, meanwhile, <laughs> Jamie's sitting back at the at the uh, finish line, and everyone's like, "Hey, Jamie, where's your team?" All right. Everybody, keep, like everybody's like, "Jamie, where's your team?" They, they should be here. Like where are the, see, because their dot hasn't left, uh, dot hasn't moved because it hasn't worked, but everybody knew what time they left TA seven. And so we knew that. And they're like, where are they? And I'm like, knowing my team, they probably stopped for lunch. Yeah. And I'm looking right now at the map and a very a beautiful place to stop, by the way. So nice. Good call on your part. Um, <laughs> um, but then after we left there and we're paddling across the bay again, um, we were, there were a lot of fish jumping and we're like, Oh, that's really neat. There's fish. And all of a sudden we see this fin, we see this, this dorsal fin cresting. I was like, Oh, uh -oh. A little nature, a little geographic moment. But then, but then we saw two, and they were curve cresting. They were dolphins. Right. Oh my gosh! There was a whole pot of dolphins just just eating. I think they were. I think they were going after the fish. I assume. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know things about dolphins. But right. we had dolphins in the bay swimming all around us, cresting, doing dolphin stuff. So we're just floating in pack rafts, just with dolphins. It's great experience. We, I was like, oh man, we won yeah. the race. This is yeah. awesome. Been there, been there. Great stuff. It's amazing when that happens. That Sometimes was... you got to stop racing and enjoy the view. And so, and then that was so that was the that was so it was sounds like it's not like during the race that you finished the race relatively well rested and well fed. Did you guys actually gain weight during the race? It sounds like no. you're stopping every place you can. <laughs> no, but we, we, oh, the Brazilian food is amazing. Oh, that's a, what a wonderful, wonderful experience you had. And then obviously, you know, the, um, the Alex had to go. She had a work thing. She had to hop off. So Alex, Alex had to go. So it sounds like if, if I understand correctly, that you, 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 you went into the race with proper expectations. When things went haywire, they went sideways. You adjusted those expectations and you just kept on, kept it on, kept on going. And all of a sudden it just it worked out fine for you. It sounds like you had a great experience all around. Yeah. yeah. I, uh, I think I, I broke first personally from, from a mental standpoint. And uh, because I'd never, I'd never like had to fill up water from a stream before. I've never right. had to treat water before. There were just so many new like first things for me. And I was like, we're going to run out of food. We're going to run out of water. I, we got to turn back. I don't know what we're going to do. And Alex and <laughs> like this is when we were on the motorcycle trails. Alex and uh, John were just like, no, we're fine. There's water right. everywhere. And I was like, you're right. There's water everywhere. We're fine. But it's a pretty well found that like you feel really ex like if, if you if you live in, in in modern society, you're surrounded by, you know, you hit 911 and the army shows up at your house. Right. The, the police show up and everything's great. And the fire department's there. And then we inject ourselves into parts of the world in which we're just it's more it's much more desolate, much more barren. And you're just out there. And there is no if you get hurt out there. 
Like it's going to be, you're going to wait a couple, a long time. And then the helicopters are coming to get you. If you're in lucky. Fact, at one, at one point we were paddling um, across the bay on day, I don't know, one and a half or whatever mm-hmm. it was. And we were kind of open to the uh, Atlantic ocean yep. and there's probably seven, eight foot swells yep. coming in and we're in those pack rafts. And, you know, it starts thundering and lightning and, and storming on us. And we're two kilometers from the shore. Yeah, it gets real. Point, you know, and, and Alex and I were talking in our boat, like, what would we do if we flipped over? And I'm like, stay with the boat and swim. Yeah. Like, nobody coming to get us. Yep, yep. We had yeah. that when we were in Itera and uh, started yeah. off with a, a really big yeah. I- Iona yeah. Island out to Staffa. And someone said to the race director, Are, is there a rescue boat? And the race director's answer was, well, there is a boat but you are each other's rescue boats. Like the yeah. idea that your job is to take care of yourself. out. Those there. were incredibly sturdy pack rafts. Yeah, pack, pack rafts yeah. want to stay upright. They don't want, they don't want to go over. Amazing. Yeah, but to, to Lori's point, I, I really do. Like one of the things that I, I, I really like, like appreciated as our team from this standpoint, like, like Lori was talking about where she may have felt like uncomfortable or in her turn broke for, I don't really see it that, but from the standpoint, like for me, like there was a time where like there was a night where I, I was hurting. I got really, I mean, I was just tired. I was hurting. I, I just, and it's being able to have enough trust in your teammates right. to say, Hey, I'm hurting. And Lori and Alex were right there. Mm-hmm. And they were like, mm-hmm. let me grab your stuff. We're going to keep moving. And they grabbed my stuff right. for the next right. couple of hours. And, and, and then, you know, and I had a chance to get some protein bars and we get some food in me. And then four hours later, I was feeling fine. Yeah. But it's having enough trust in your teammates and in yourself to say, you know what? I'm hurting. I need help. Right, right. And then and then giving some gear, so your pack away to somebody else, even for a little while, it's amazing how that acts as such a recovery tool inside the race. Right. Just taking some of that weight off for just yep. the littlest bit. You get it's it's a the, the body's an amazing thing. Did you have the experience? And I and I, I think this this is a nice one for you, Lori, is this was so new to you. Did you have the experience uh, we hear very often um, when you get through the third night, really, once you pass through the third night, all of a sudden you're just your machine. You can keep racing for as long as you have to because you're out there for a long time. Yeah. Did you did you have that experience? Yeah, I think I did. I uh, this is where I realized like I when I once I realized I didn't really need sleep. Right. Um, that I was like, oh, well, this is fine. You just keep moving. I can I can keep moving. That's right. that's fine. Um, then and that was that was really it. Um, when we once we were back on the bikes on day four or five ish, um, when uh, we we ended up uh, spending some time in a town called Anitopolis, and from there uh, we biked from there to TA six, gotcha. and that day on the bike was really delightful. I mean, it was it was just fun biking. It was hard, um, but we just kept going, and you know, like end of the day, we roll up into into the TA, and we're like. All right, this was a great day. Yeah, but just you just your body adjusts, right? And it's amazing yeah. how you don't realize people don't realize how strong their bodies are and how much they're capable of until they put themselves in something like this. Like to your point, Lori, like you said that this was so new to you, like the treating the water and this and the and the, that kind of uh, bike travel and all that sort of stuff. And you realize that you're so much better, so much stronger. Um, have the, yeah. have have you had a chance? And, and this is a question for anybody. Like, have your have you have you readjusted? To the way that you see the world as a result of this race. Well, I'm casually signing up for an 18 hour race next month. And that, like, I, and I'm just, I can just do that on a whim now. Gotcha. Like, yeah. like, something that used to seem really daunting to me is now just like, Oh, whatever. Yeah. And, and that's amazing. Right. How that happened. What, what race is that? Uh, Dino, 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 uh, the, Dino series. the, the yep. mission, the 18 hour mission. Yep. 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 Good race. And to your point now, all of a sudden, cause you've done the five and a half days of racing, you could step into a shorter race and know you have much more, you have capacity and skill. And then, and then the whole world is open to you after that. Like you can go come to another race, go find another ARWS yeah, race and go I, race someplace I actually, else. I actually like somehow in the two weeks after I got back from Brazil, forgot how hard it was and yeah. signed up uh, with another team of strangers for the Pennsylvania. Uh, what is that one called? Are you doing uh, endless mountains? Um, you're, you're right, endless yeah, mountains. sorry. Yeah, I signed up for endless mountains with a team, a, a team of three people I've never met before. Do you mean you know your team name? Who this? Who this? Okay. Who so, this? so, so I mean, if 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 you if you listen to the podcast from time to time, endless mountains comes up. Um, I will be at that race for all five days. I volunteer for that race, and I'll be on site, and that is will absolutely be. 
you have a fantastic experience and your experience in Brazil will inform your experience in Endless Mountains. You're going to awesome. love that. I'm, yeah, I'm Rootstock Racing does a great job with fives. that. Looking yeah. forward to some endless high fives from you. Yeah, cool. you're going to love it. Yeah, so even though I was um, swearing that I was going to retire, mm-hmm. um, I'm, I'm doing the, I'm actually doing the Colorado, Expedition Colorado 80 hour as a solo. Um, okay. And then I'm doing Expedition Canada in 2024. So Jamie, how about you now? You So it sounds like you had a really rough lesson early in the race about nutrition and, you know, yeah. clearly, where are you in terms of your your, your big race future? Well, you know, you asked a question here first real quick. I want to touch on, um, but you asked how it's changed the way that we've looked at things. You know, the thing that I find interesting and, and what I guess I learned out of this race more than anything, you know, we just talked for over an hour mm-hmm. and we never mentioned the finish line once, you know, it's adventure racing is about the journey, right. and, you know, it's about the race. It's not, it's not that finish. And for me, I've always been such a goal oriented person that it's always about, you know, hitting that goal. Right. And this race really helped me understand, you know, the whole life's a journey type phrase, which I never really understood. Yeah. I, um, yeah. I heard something not too long ago. Someone says, is it the journey or is it, or is it the destination? Someone wrote, it's the company. Yeah. Right. It's not, it's, it's who you do, who you do it alongside. Right. And to your right. point. So what's your, what's your plan now? You have another race on your horizon. Um, so I'm going to do a couple of, uh, just more local races. Um, the ARWS series, I'm doing rib mountain and, Good. uh, the suburb mule great um, races. Couple, Those are great races. A couple of different teams. Um, I actually get the opportunity to do uh rib mountain with my 15 year old daughter and it'll oh. be her first overnight, uh, race, uh, a friend of mine and I are doing that and we're doing that as team to wall. So pretty excited. Uh, for that one. Fantastic. Uh, and then uh, other than that, that's that's really all we have this year. Just a lot going on with uh, kids and everything else. But that's that, all, it's all about, you know, you know, you know, life and figuring things out along the way and, right, and squeezing the races out when you can. John, you mentioned before you do races, let's get a little commercial for you. What What's your race company? What do you got coming on? Oh, oh, thank you. So, yes. Yeah, so I started the um, Pocket Gopher Challenge. Uh, so my race, so I have uh, the Pocket Gopher Challenge is coming up on the 15th of July. Um, I have a five hour, a 12 hour and an 18 hour, um, both the 12 and the 18 hour are ARWS races. So I'm very proud to be racing with them as for, and Wisconsin. So, um, yeah, it's going to be down in Southern Minnesota. It's going to be an absolutely uh, fantastic race. Um, always a good time. So, um, yeah, thanks. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. I, Lord, I can plug cl- John's races too. I think they're fantastic. Very nice. Thank you. It's, it's a commercial. It's an infomercial for John Tracy. Yep. This is great. I, and all, I, I and all have, this, all this advertising I, is free, John. What else could you ask for? I, I know. This is awesome. <laughs> and I do have to say one thing because Jamie mentioned it. I think we're the only team that when we crossed the finish line, we brought leftovers with us. <laughs> we were also singing. <laughs> yes, we were. I like the fact, John, that you were mad that you carried so much food with you. Oops. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yes. Um, so, so we're, we're going to wrap it up here. Lori, I'd love for you to give us some closing thoughts. We're going to close that. We'll close out with you. Finish us up. Take thoughts. us home. Uh, Ooh, I, so this is really hard, but all I remember is how much fun I had. And I just want to keep doing these things. Like, this is so fun. <laughs> I'm a, I'm a race addict. Well, there you have it, folks. Episode number 90 of the dark zone. Thanks to everybody from team Nawal for coming on to the show. Like I've promised in the beginning, a lot there, a lot that went on. They had a great experience. As a bit of a footnote, I bumped into this team, a chunk of them, at uh, Hootis up at Endless Mountains, and they had a great experience there too. So a lot of racers, a lot of fun, and it was delightful to talk with them for the Dark Zone. Thank you for being a listener. Uh, the Dark Zone would not be here without you. 90 episodes in, who believes it? If you like what you're hearing here, write, click, do those things on the internets and it makes everybody happy. Keep training, keep racing, have fun. If you keep racing, we'll keep talking.